Hey, good morning, Grace. Good to see you guys. Um, you know, we're going to have a great time this morning. We're going to be in John, so you can turn there. And we looked at the intro to John last week, and this week, we're going to look at the first five verses. And the book of John is so unique, and, and I'm sure it's for some of you, you've read through the book of John before. This is your first time through it, so... I hope through our study, um, the Lord reveals himself to you in, in fresh ways. So this is your, if this is your you know, second, third, fourth time going through it, even if it's your first, I, I pray that God just paints this really marvelous picture of Christ, which is what's intended through the book of John. So before we uh, get started this morning, would you join me in a word of prayer? And let's just ask the Father to uh, bless our time in the word this morning to illuminate our minds and help us to understand and give us a will, really, to obey what we, what we read. Father, I thank you for this morning, the opportunity that we have to jump into your word, to, to read these verses here, Father. I pray that uh, you would speak to us as we read, that, God, you would reveal Christ to us, that we would, we would have the picture of of Christ that you're painting in the book of John just laid out before us, we would see Christ in all of his marvelous glory, that we would behold him and really take him in and understand who he is, that I pray that these truths would really transform and impact our hearts and our minds and our attitudes. I pray that, Father, you would show us how we can apply what we learn today. I pray you would speak to each one of us very individually today. I pray that you'd speak to us as well corporately as a body. Help us to understand how um, you're speaking to us and, and who Christ is and how that affects our church and how we do church and what we do together. Father, I pray that Christ would be magnified today through the preaching of your word, the teaching of your word, and, and the study of it. Father, thank you for giving us Christ, the word, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I spy with my little eye, you guys are like, oh no, what is he spying? Someone on their phone texting out, I'm sure. Um, I spy with my little eye someone with a red shirt. I spy with my little eye something square. I spy with my little eye someone with glasses. You know, you're all looking around. He's talking about. Um, you guys have probably all played the I Spy game, right? When you were children, you guys have played this game, I Spy. Very classic game. Um, or if you have children, I Spy is a classic diversion tactic, right? <laughs> On your way to church, and you go, ah, kids are screaming, hey, let's play a game. I Spy, you know. Um, so I'm sure you've played it, maybe you've played it on a road trip before. That's when you know the road trip is taking a turn for the worse, right? <laughs> when you're playing I Spy, you're like, oh, man, this is going to be a long trip. About an hour into it, you're like, all right, I spy people sleeping. And I, I you know, I used to love playing the game and, and trying to figure out, um, what people were looking at. People, when we play that game, we're describing things, right? We're looking at things and we're describing them. Um, we're, we're, you know, talking about characteristics or attributes of, of something or someone. Let's say you were playing the I Spy game and you saw Jesus, all right? He appeared before you in a miraculous way. He's there and you're playing the I Spy game. What would you say about Jesus? Like, talking about him. How would you describe him? You might say, I spy with my little eye someone with a beard. You know, I spy with my little eye someone with nail piercings. You know, I spy with my little eye someone who rose from the grave. You know, how would you talk about Jesus or describe him as you, you know, as you think about him in your mind's eye right now, I mean, what, what sort of things, what would you, how would you talk about Christ? Um, what characteristics, what attributes would you say of him? And I think, you know, how does John, the apostle, describe Jesus? You know, what does he, what does he say about Christ? And that's 
his gospel. And how he begins is, is very important. Now, you know, think about, you know, the old school papers he used to write. You know, that introduction was always very important, right? It served a very important part of the paper. And so the beginning is, is crucial. So let's look at how John begins his gospel. And, and let's compare it with how the other gospel writers begin their works. So the gospel of Matthew, if you go back and look at it, it begins with the genealogy of Jesus, and he traces it back to Abraham. So he starts by showing that Jesus' origins come from Abraham. The Gospel of Mark begins with John the Baptist. The Gospel of Luke begins with the births of John the Baptist and Jesus. So how does, how does John begin his Gospel? Let's read the first five verses to see how he starts it. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's how John begins his gospel. And we might ask the question, well, why does John begin his gospel this way? I want you uh, to think about, uh, the. actually turn with me, uh, we'll, we'll look at Matthew chapter 17. And we'll see, I think, maybe why John starts his gospel this way. John was uh, famously part of the inner, the inner three disciples, Peter, James, and John. It was these three disciples who experienced Jesus' transfiguration. So you might be thinking, what in the world does the word or the term transfiguration mean? Uh, it means to change one's outward appearance. To change one's outward appearance. Uh, so, you know, you got a new term there, maybe. You can use it in the gym when you're working out, you know, like, man, who's ready to be transfigured, right? And we were like, what's, what's he talking about? That sounds crazy. Changing one's outward appearance. So Jesus, he, uh, in Matthew chapter 17, he takes Peter, James, and John up on a mountain, and there he was transfigured before them, and the gospel we read of Matthew, we read that Jesus' face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Then the passage says, Moses and Elijah appeared to them and began talking with Jesus. So I love Peter's response to, to everything that happens, to Christ changing his outward appearance and everything. Peter says this, Lord... It is good that we are here. The first time I read that, you know how I read it? I read it like this. Lord, is it good that we are here? <laughs> and the first time I read it, I thought, well, that's kind of funny. Like, I could totally see myself saying that. And then I went back and I read it again. I said, wait, no, he's not asking a question. Instead, he makes this beautiful statement. Lord, it is good that we are here. And why should he not say this, right? I mean, for just a short time here on earth, the curtain of heaven is pulled back, and they saw a glimpse of Jesus in all of his glory. And in this epic vision of heaven, speaking with Moses and Elijah. So that experience, I would think, is going to leave a mark on you psychologically, right? Like, you're going to remember that. So that's going to influence, I think, how he's going to start his gospel and what he's going to have to say about Jesus. So let's, um, let's begin by going back to verse 1, looking at Jesus' origins. And the origins that John, he doesn't trace it back to Abraham. He doesn't trace it to Joseph. He doesn't trace it to David. He traces it all the way back to Jesus' heavenly origins. And verse 1, John says, In the beginning was the Word. 
So let's stop there. We're going to maybe, some of you guys like to take notes and points. We might say, you know, all of today's sermon is really about the person of Christ, who he is. So what's the first thing that we learn about Jesus? Well, the first thing that we learn, and we're going to come back to this, is that he's called the Word. He's called the Word. The second thing we uh, learn about Jesus is that he was in the beginning. The third thing that we learn is that Jesus was with God. The fourth thing that we learn is that Jesus was God. The following, we learn that all things were made through him. Then we learn in him was life. We learn about Christ that he was the life. The life was the light of men. And then we finally learn that this light, he himself shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So you can just go through that and just break it down and, and look at all the ways that, Jesus, that John is talking about Jesus, who he is. So we read right from the beginning, in the beginning was the word. And we're going to we're going to leave the word for the end of the sermon. We're going to come back to that. But in the beginning, should remind us very much of Genesis 1.1. If you go back there, it says, In the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So John is taking us all the way back to that point. In the beginning was the word. And we, we learn that the word is, is Jesus. And we'll see it as we go on through chapter 1. The Word becomes identified as Jesus. We look in verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So this eternal Word, this God, this, this being that's always existed takes on flesh. And we learn that this is Christ. So he's in the beginning with God. And it says that in the Word was with God. And the word was God. So that's very important to, to see is that the word Jesus, he's with God. So what John is trying to help us to see is, is that the word is not, like that there's, there's separation here. There's two persons. So we could say that from just reading this, we see at the very beginning there's, there's evidence of the Trinity. I mean, John's talking about the Trinity here, right? That there's two persons in the Godhead. You have the Word and God, and the Word was with God, and then John says, but the Word was God. So the early church makes this incredible confession very early on. It says that the Trinity, you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one essence. Three persons, one essence. So everything that makes God, God, all three share Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're all three God in essence, but three persons. So I could give you guys, I mean, no illustration, no analogy really does that justice. The best thing to do so that way you don't find yourself saying things that are not true about God is just leave the egg alone. Don't talk about the Trinity as an egg or as you know, water, vapor, you know, all this other kind of stuff. Like just, you know, it's mind-boggling. We'll never understand it. So it's a teaching that Scripture gives, and we, ex and we say, yes, I believe that. So to believe that Jesus is not God is not to believe the testimony of Scripture. It's very clear here. So in the beginning, he was with God, separate, but he is God. So Jesus was with God and is God. So you have this separation here. So you could say it this way. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. The Holy Spirit is not the Father or the Son. You know. But the Father is God. The, the Son is God. And the Holy Spirit is God. We read at, in verse 2. It's just really... You can see John's making a point here of talking about Jesus. He was in the beginning with God. So John's making a point here. Whenever we think about Jesus, what ought to come to our mind 
we, going back to that beginning. We ought to think of him as in the beginning, someone who's eternal, God, creator. These are names, attributes, per, you know, what belongs to Jesus and who he is. Verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So Christ, he's the one who spoke things. I mean, just consider going back to Genesis, and, and, and God says, he speaks it, and he says, let there be light, and there was light. And he says, let there be living things that creep on the earth. Let them reproduce according to their kind. And it was so. So we have God speaking things into existence, you know, calling things to be that have no existence. I mean, to think about the power of that. And, and Jesus, it is saying here in John, he's the one who brought it into existence. He is God's agent of creation. He brought things into being by just speaking them into existence. And I think about the power of his word. If you go and you read John 11, Lazarus dies. Jesus doesn't go in and touch Lazarus to bring him back from the dead. He says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, who has been dead for days, comes back from the grave and walks out of the tomb. He spoke it and it happened. Verse 4 says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Life and light are two ideas, two terms that occur throughout John over and over and talking about Jesus. So if we look at John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John 8, I am the light of the world. So he takes these things on and he says, this is, this is who I am. He is life and he is light. In verse 5, it says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So I want us to just think, because we, we pick up a lot of, of, of who Christ is here, a, a lot of truth. I mean, I think when you read this, and you start to break it down, and you consider who Christ is, you know, you're, you're called to either dismiss this and say, I don't believe it, or I do believe it, right? I mean, we can maybe parse it out into things that fall under that. But you either believe it or you don't. I mean, these are very straightforward truths about who Christ is. Christ is eternal. He has no beginning. He has no end. He was with God in the beginning. He's not the Father, and he's not the Holy Spirit, that the Trinity exists, that you have... Jesus is God. He's not, just a per, he's not just a man, but he is God, very God. That Jesus created all things. That he's the life and the light of men. And so it's like you either have to believe and receive those things or you reject them. And, you know, I think about that knock sometimes that you get at your door. I don't know if you've ever gotten it where you, you hear a knock and you open it up. And, you know, there's a Jehovah's Witness, you know, and you're like, oh man, about to get into it now, right? <laughs> and you introduce yourself, you start talking, maybe you don't, and you just say, hey, you know, no thank you, you close the door. <laughs> um, I've thought, once I've gotten, you know, about an hour into conversations, I'm like, man, I wish I would have chose that way. Um, but you're talking with them, and you go round and round and round and round, right? And, it's, and you're thinking, like, um, I mean, I feel like I'm being really clear, you know? And, it, and it's the reality of, you know, what I've come to realize is that my role and responsibility, and this is key, I think, and this involves evangelism, or whenever you're talking about the nature of God and who he is, it's crucial to understand what your responsibility is and what what God's responsible for, right? What, what he's going to do. So nobody in this room can make somebody believe something. 
So, like, you can't talk to a Jehovah's Witness and make them believe that Jesus is God. Like, just throw that idea out the window. It's not going to happen. And even if you could make them believe it, do you really want to be the one who made them believe it? You know, because surely if you can talk them into believing it, somebody can talk them out of believing it. So you just have to say, all right, my responsibility is just to talk about who Christ is. Their responsibility is to hear it and believe it, or hear it and disregard it. God's responsibility, what God's going to do, is God's going to open up their heart. God's going to open up their mind to receive it. He's going to be the one who does the work of conversion. He's going to be the one who makes them a Christian. You know, we can't do that. We don't have the power to do that. That's not our responsibility. And so sometimes we get into these conversations and we keep like spinning our wheels and we do it and we go over and over and over and over and over and we're trying so hard to do it because we think if we could just come up with the right way to say it, if we could just say the right words, then they're going to, they're going to get it and they're going to believe. And I could say that because I think that was my attitude for a while. But it was only when I came to really understand you know, what's my, what does God call me to do? What's, what's he responsible for, and what are they responsible for? So we're responsible for hearing it and believing it, and if we believe this, we're responsible to faithfully teach it to others. So what, what's like, why is this important? I mean, we look at what we've learned here about Christ and who he is, and I think maybe like you are, like these are really great truths about Christ and about who he is. You know, like what's the practical implication for my life and how I live? And so here are a few things that I thought of as we consider who Christ is. John is painting a big picture of Christ. I mean, his hope is that you get this big picture of who Christ is. You really understand who Christ is and that, and that you believe it and that it transforms your life. And so I talked a little bit about this last week, that worship leads to transformation. You will not become more like Christ unless you are worshiping Christ. So John 15, Jesus says, I'm the vine, right? And he says, you're what? The branches. And we bear fruit if we abide in the vine. You, you can staple, you can, you can go out to a tree that's dead, and you can staple fruit to it. And what's going to happen to the fruit? It's going to die. Because it's not really connected to the tree, and the tree's not living. So, like, you can morally try to do it. You know, like, look at everything that God commands, and you can try to live that way. Just, you know, I'm going to do this good thing, I'm going to do this good thing, but soon that will fail. Like, it won't work. And worse than that, you'll find that you die anyways because you're not connected to Christ this living vine. So it's important that we understand that like worship and transformation go together. That if you are not worshiping Christ, you will never look like Christ. And for some of us in this room, I don't understand what it is, but we just want to know what we want to do. And we really, really don't care about worshiping Christ. Now I'm not saying everybody but I'm saying, honestly, like, look at your heart and your life, and would you say that you worship God, that you have a true worship of God, that, that you enjoy Him, that you have this big picture of Him, that he, he affects you, that you praise Him for who He is? Or is it like it's become stale, and you just kind of go through the routine, you show up for worship service, and you kind of read about what you can do and what you can't do, and so I encourage you, like, your life ought to be a life of worship. And that's where the transformation really occurs. Jesus, or John says, that 
Jesus was in the beginning with God, that all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So as I consider that and I think about it, like, obviously John is trying to get us to think about creation and how, how Jesus breathed life into man. It says in Genesis that God breathed life into man and he became a living being. In the same way, Jesus breathes life into us spiritually. He breathes life into us. John eleven twenty five. 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though someday he die, yet he will live again. And to think, well, how can Jesus say that? The reason Jesus could say that is because he's the creator God. Because he did it in the beginning. He spoke things into existence. And he can speak life into you. He can cause you to come alive where you were dead spiritually. Now you're alive spiritually. Because he is the life. He is the light. I think about in our times, I don't know if you ever like just look on your phone and you get overwhelmed by all the stuff that's happening. If you've ever come to a place where you're just like, is there, what hope is there? You know, what good is there? And I come back and I realize there is goodness there is light, there is truth, there is beauty, and the reason that there is is because he is. He exists. Jesus exists, and because he exists, and because he will never cease to exist, there's hope for our world. There's hope for us. There's hope for all the brokenness that we see. He is the light of men. He opens up people's eyes to see what is good and true. Just like Jesus with the blind man, when we go back and we read John 8, and he says, I am the light of the world. The blind man, he, he spits and creates this mixture of mud and spit, and it's really disgusting, but he wipes it on this guy's eyes, and he opens his eyes. He causes this guy who is blind to see again. Jesus is the hope, morally speaking, Morally speaking, it's not electing a politician, getting the right people into office. The hope for people seeing what is honest and good and true and right is Christ. He is a light that pierces into the darkness and opens the eyes of the blind. Spiritually speaking, he opens it up and helps us to see what is right and good and true. I love this last verse, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. What hope that is, that Christ is the light, and no amount of darkness, no amount of anything that, that is happening in our world, the evil that we see, people, people um, just recently down in Arkansas, I'm sure you guys read in the news about people who were killed in a club in Arkansas, and those things are becoming so routine that we just wonder, you know, where is and we don't even have to go that extreme, right? We can just, I just saw the other day someone, you know, cut somebody off. <laughs> and then they yelled out the window and, like, cussed at them. And I thought, like, why? You know? Like, what's, what's all the hope for all, the, for all this that we're going through? And, and maybe, I don't know if you ever thought, like, I don't know. Sometimes it's hard to believe that, like, good's going to win. It just seems like so much bad is, is here. And verse 5 reminds us that the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That just when Christ said, let there be light, and there was light, the darkness did not overcome his words. He spoke his words out. Light came, right? It wasn't like he spoke those words, and darkness was like, no. <laughs> no light. Just darkness. He spoke it. Light came Darkness wasn't able to overcome it. And as we read through the New Testament, we find that light and darkness are used for, for good and evil. For God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. 
for the world of God and the world of men and all that the world of men represents. And so we find these, these two, and it's not, it's not yin-yang. You know, you guys have seen that symbol where you have white and, you know, light and darkness, and they just coexist, and they form this balance. It's not that way. It says the light shines in the darkness. It pierces it. And what we read in Revelation is that the light overcomes the darkness. So we could read the light shines in the darkness and the light overcomes the darkness. So our hope, our hope is not ourselves. It's not, it's not even the church. It's not a politician. It's a person. It's Christ. It's, it's himself. It's looking to him, beholding him, treasuring him, worshiping him for who he is, letting that transform you. So you go out, and, and you li- you're not going out and trying to make disciples and, and just do all this just because it's a mere command, but it's because you behold Christ, and the love of Christ is filling you up And you go out and you want to share that with others. You want other people to know Christ. And to know the love of Christ and who he is. And I can't, through my preaching, I can't impart that. Like, you know, people all the time say, oh, Paul, you're so passionate, blah, blah, blah. I can't, through any of this means, impart that to you. My prayer for you guys is that you're willing to, You're willing to really, like, just turn and look at Christ, to really read about him, to study him, to look at who he is, to believe in who he is and who John presents him to be. I am the resurrection and life. To really believe that and to really worship Christ and to really be transformed by it. And you may honestly think, that does not sound so practical, but I guarantee you it is incredibly practical. I can say, and I think for a lot of you guys, I've read it, like, or I've, I've heard you guys say it, that you've had a hard time loving somebody. And the reason why you came round on loving somebody, the reason why you came round and you reconciled that relationship was because you worshiped Christ. You sat long enough to really think about his love and what he did for you that you allowed it to transform how you were going to treat other people. Like Sherry, you know, I I talk with Sherry, um, and I I guarantee you, like if I talk with her, the love of Christ brought that about. It wasn't just merely, I feel like this is my duty. And so like the love of Christ, who who he is, transforms us. So my prayer this morning is not that you, I hope that you believe the right things. I hope that you believe what, what John is presenting here about Christ, right? But more importantly than just knowing the right things, my prayer for you is that you worship the person you're reading about. You don't just read it to get more information, but you're, you're really seeking to worship Christ, the eternal God creator who is life and light, who bears hope for our world that he shines in the darkness and the darkness will not overcome it, that his kingdom will prevail, his will pr- will prevail, and no matter what we see, what happens in our world, we know that God has a plan and he's going to work it out. And nothing will overcome that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. For Christ. The word. And God, we we know that he is. He is the word. He's the one who creates. He's the one who gives life. He's the one who delivers. Father, we. We give ourselves to you. We want to sit at the feet of Christ. We want to worship. We want to know Christ. 
to worship him, to love him. Father, I pray that as that happens, we would be transformed into the image of Christ. We'd look and be more and more like Christ through that worship of him. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for our time together in your word. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Paul.